Let all the earth keep silent before him. Let us praise his holy name. Amen, amen. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. Amen, amen, amen. Let us all get in an attitude of prayer. Father God, thank you for giving us your spirit. Fill us afresh as we begin this school year. As summer draws to a close, we begin to focus our attention to the activities of autumn. For some, it will mean preparing children for school. For others, youth will be preparing to enter college or the workforce. We rely on you, Holy Spirit, to recall things back to our minds. Be with us, O oh Lord, as we encounter life's challenges. Enable us to learn and soak up knowledge that draws us closer to you. Be our mouthpiece as we speak to others. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O oh Lord. Help us to grow closer to you and to each other, Lord. 
Be with us today as we come to you from all of life's circumstances. Give us courage and strength and knowledge and fill us with your love and grace that we may serve you effectively and fully for the rest of our days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Good morning, welcome all. Look around, look at a neighbor, look at somebody you've never seen before and say good morning. Wave at them. church family. Good Let's give God some praise for gathering us here. Once again. Your morning scripture lesson will be coming from Psalm chapter 107 verses 1 through 6. Please stand if you're able and remain standing for the reading of the New Testament. the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeem of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives embedded away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Amen. This has been the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for all the beautiful wishes that I've been getting for um, it's really been just beautiful to come back to um, a church home like this. And I just want to say thank you to God for bringing me through four years of college. For having, his, for having his merciful hand on me. So I just wanted to say that. So um, your New Testament reading is coming from 3 John, the, fir the first chapter, the second verse through the sixth coming from the NIV, and it reads, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that you all may go all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about the faithfulness to the truth, telling about how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even through the strangers to you. They have told, they have told the church about you. Please send them on their way in the manner that it, in a manner that God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So now I have the affirmation of faith. Please read along. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and he sits at the right hand. Good morning. Good morning. I 
at this time, we want to offer special prayer as we prepare for another academic year. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask the educators, the teachers, staff members, the custodians, all of those who help make the educational process possible. I'm going to invite you to come to the altar. For the children that are already in the choir stand, I'm going to ask that they remain where they are. But if there are children in the congregation, I'm going to ask also that you approach the altar. Amen. Hallelujah. For the Apostle Paul reminded Timothy, he said, study to show yourself approved. So you don't have to be ashamed of your work in the presence of human beings, nor in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. What educators do are so very important in the lives of all people. And it pays dividends for years to come. If you know how to read today, you have to thank a teacher. Amen. Amen. No matter what your station in life may be, somewhere along the way, someone taught, took the time to teach you. And it wasn't just to read and write, but taught you self-discipline and, and values that are so necessary in order to live a full and rich life. For educators who are retired, if you'll just wait, raise your hand where you are. Amen. For the educators are retired, they taught the present educators, amen? <laughs> and it goes without saying, it's much more difficult to be a teacher now than it was 20, 30 years ago, amen? You got to be a social worker, psychiatrist. Uh, oftentimes, you got to be the second parent. You got to go shopping for folk and everything else. So let us go to God in prayer. Now, dear gracious God, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for public education. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for teachers. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the custodians. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the administrators. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for those who prepare the meals for our children. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the truck drivers, Lord, who deliver supplies to the schools. Oh, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for everyone involved in the process. And, Lord, may you bless particularly public education, Lord, with outstanding leadership. Lord, that those who will do the best for our children who will not get caught up on private and hidden political agendas. Oh, Lord, for indeed a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Oh, Lord, but the failure to provide our children and our educators, Lord, what they need in order to do their best is also a great waste. So, Lord, pour out your spirit on all the educators and the students, Lord, and everyone engaged in the process. Lord, strengthen them on days when they grow weary. Lord, and students, when they struggle, Lord, may they have teachers who give a word of encouragement, who are patient and compassionate, who speaks life, who tells them that they can be successful, Lord, even when there may be few evidence. Oh, Lord, may our children not receive words of no value throughout the day. Lord, as parents, Lord, may we support the educators. And Lord, and may we not wait until the report card comes to inquire with the teacher. Lord, but may we communicate on a regular basis, support our children and support our teachers, Lord, so that they will all work together as one. Oh, Lord, you know, throughout the year across this nation, from time to time, Lord, violence, Lord, raises his head on campuses. Oh, Lord, may our educational process, Lord, provide the necessary security. And Lord, we know that no matter how many officers and no matter how many metal detectors, Lord, nothing is like changing the hearts of people who will do harm. And so, Lord, we ask, Lord, that no one, 
Lord, will be bullied, Lord, when they go to school, that no one will have a root of bitterness, Lord, where they, they then respond and take it out on the whole campus. Oh, Lord, and when individuals, Lord, point out that there's a need, that there's a mental health problem, Lord, may parents, Lord, support the possibility, Lord, that something is going to rise. Lord, may we be mindful and know what's happening in the lives of our children. And the house belongs to us as the parents. And Lord, and sometimes when they are away, Lord, we need to take a walk through the room. We need to check the drawers. We need to look under the bed. Lord, we need to look in the closet. Lord, because it's not always somebody else's child who's in trouble. It could be ours. So Lord, give us the courage. Lord, to do the very best by our children. Lord, may we be merciful and compassionate. And when they do well, Lord, may we celebrate with them. And when the report card comes home, Lord, and, and there's all A's and then there's one C, Lord, may we not get so hung up on the C that we, that we fail to celebrate that which they accomplished. <laughs> Lord, and may we never forget that we had our moments. Yeah, everybody in the room, Lord, was not a straight-A student. And some graduated with honors, Lord. Some graduated with thank you, Jesus. And Lord, so may we remember that our children are not called and gifted to be experts at everything. Oh, Lord, but you have a plan and purpose for their lives. And Lord, so we celebrate them on today. Lord, we're going to encourage them throughout the school year. Lord, for they have the mind of Christ. They can do all things. It's in the matchless, powerful name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. And the people of God say it together. Amen and amen.
Hallelujah. Let's give another round of praise for our children and youth. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank them so much for being faithful. We thank them so much for offering their gifts up to the Lord. We thank them for the energy that they bring to worship. Amen. Amen. We thank all of you parents, too, who make it possible to get to rehearsal. Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. For the one who has begun a great worker in them is well able to bring it to completion and to the day of Jesus Christ. For eyes have not seen and ears have not heard all the good things that God has in store for our children and youth. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, I want to thank each of you for being in worship on this Lord's Day. I thank all of our guests for being here today. And we thank God for the grandparents and aunts who may have tipped away from their own church this morning to come and to support their children and youth. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The text for the morning will be taken from John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm going to move back one verse further. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 9. I will be reading from the NRV translation. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and out and find pastors. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Now, dear gracious God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your written word. Lord, may your word come alive, Lord, as we reflect upon this passage, Lord, and how we can apply it to our everyday life. Lord, may we never forget, Lord, that your word is portable. It is not stuck in Sunday. Your word is not old and tucked away in some dusty closet. Lord, for your word transcends time. It's portable, it moves, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And Lord, so may we get a glimpse into our relationship and what you have done for us, Lord, and maybe just a new way on this Lord's day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. This passage reminds us that Jesus is the good shepherd. The reference to the gate reminds us that he is charge of security. He's the provider. He has a location for us. He has a plan for us and that he want our lives to be blessed. Amen. In this particular passage of scripture, I'm reminded of the fact that Jesus says that the thief only comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but he came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Sometimes we forget living in the 21st century that before the birth of Christ, there were many who had come forward and claimed to be the Messiah. 
They were imposters, impersonators. But Jesus is often imitated but never duplicated, amen? And so that there were those who claimed to be the Messiah, they would show up, do a couple miracles. Sometimes they travel with a posse. The village or the community is unaware that everything is pre-planned. They came through and they ran a hustle and they disappeared. Sometimes individuals would show up claiming to be the Messiah. When the folk found out they weren't the Messiah, they ended their lives in that city. And so when Jesus mentioned this about there have been others who tried to climb in over the fence, come in a different way other than by the gate, he is in part referring to these imposters who have claimed to be the Messiah. Yes, even today we see individuals who will take the word of God and use it and twist it for their own personal gains. I don't have to call the role. You are very familiar with them. Those who hoodwink folk telling you that if only you would send me $1,000, I promise you in 90 days you will be out of debt. Well, if you didn't get in debt in 90 days, you probably won't get out in 90. Amen. Hallelujah. I suggest rather than sending that $1,000 in the mail or by uh, electronic means, I suggest you take that money and apply it towards your debt. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You can better use it than whoever's asking for it. And when you're sick and in the hospital, they won't be there. In fact, when your prayer request shows up, oftentimes your prayer request won't even be open. They simply look at the goods that you're provided. So oftentimes, I, I believe that the people of God sometimes forget the promises of God. That we forget that God wants us to have a good life, a rewarding life, a life that is meaningful, a life that is filled with joy. Now, when he says in the text, he said, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's not a promise that everybody's going to be rich. That's, that's not a promise that sometimes that you, your ends won't meet and won't, can't even turn around and look at each other. That's not what this text is saying. But this text is saying that he takes our lives and look at it from a holistic way. That he's saying that we know that no matter what your financial situation may be, you need some peace of mind. You need some joy. You need some harmony in your relationships. When you fall short of the glory of God and offend those, particularly the ones you love, you need them to show you some mercy and some compassion. When you are struggling and feel like giving up, you need folk who will encourage you. Amen. So he said, I want you to have a good life. He says that I am at the gate. And in order to pass into this abundant life, though, that you must come through the gate. You can't go and climb across the fence on the back 40. You can't get a ladder and climb over and, and think you're going to get in by trickery. But the thing about it is when we pass through the gate, it's with inside the gate in which the son introduces us to the father. That restores our broken relationship with the father. You remember in the text he said, I'm the good shepherd. And those who come through this gate, they are saved. This saved is not talking about just eternal life. That means that he intends to journey with us on this side. And be with us as we live our lives out from one moment to the next. And see, a good shepherd will make sure that the sheep has proper provisions. When the water hole that they may be at dries up, he finds fresh water. When the sheep has eaten all the graze land and all the grass is gone, he finds new locations. And you see, when you're a shepherd, you got to stay up all night long. Somebody must be on watch. And so normally in the ancient world, when shepherds were working, rarely did they ever work alone. They had to work in shifts because they knew as soon as they fell asleep, here a wolf or a coyote or a bear or a lion or something was going to show up for some lamb chops, amen. And so what Jesus is saying in the text is that I'm going to be constantly on guard. I'm going to constantly be watching over your life. I'm not going to let anything catch you by surprise. Don't you know the Lord is never surprised by anything that happens in our lives or in the world? 
But more than that, this is more than just an individual word. This is the word to the body of Christ. Telling the church to remain alert. Don't be hoodwinked. Don't be misdirected. Don't be fooled by someone with a smooth game. There's a lot of smooth games out there. You can see it when you watch the news. Sometimes you'll find and not always senior citizens and someone will be testifying to the news reporter that I was talking to them and they told me if I just sent $5,000 tomorrow, I get $10,000 back. What was I thinking? <laughs> and no matter how many times this happens, it happens over and over and over again. Because people are trying to take shortcuts in order to get out of their troubles. Don't you know when you're in trouble, you got to have a plan to get out of your trouble? When conditions are not favorable for you, you got to put together a plan. And if someone offers you a shortcut, you're probably going to get cut. See, shortcuts never really ever work out. It's usually the one who's offering the shortcut who winds up benefiting from our troubles. I'm amazed that no matter what the community may look like, no matter how expensive the real estate may be, there's always palm breeders located there. And I ask myself all the time, how do these people stay in business? Well, I know that if you're in business, the only way you can stay in business, you must have some customers. Yes. And I oftentimes wonder what kind of people go to see a palm reader. I'm saying, what, what, what would be their profile? What do you think the profile would be for the typical person who goes to see a palm reader? Just on the surface, you would probably assume that it was a person who may have some spirituality that is not based in Christ. See, they believe in the power of something or someone to change their condition, but it's just misplaced. I believe that if we went to see a palm reader and they came clean with us, I believe that the palm reader would say that half of their customers are Christians. Don't look at me like that. Don't, don't look at me like that. I believe at least half of those customers are, 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 are Christians. And, and they think that they can go to the palm reader and then take the word of God, mix it up together real good, and with the help of the Lord and the palm reader, they should be able to accomplish anything, particularly if they put the right amount of money in the palm reader's hand. I don't know any male palm readers. There may be some out there, but I don't know of any male palm readers. As my, grand my grandmother would oftentimes remind us when we were teenagers and we first started dating, my grandmother would always tell us this as young men, I have six brothers. And my grandmother would say, boys, don't let a woman squeeze your shoulders and make a fat out of you. Now let me translate that for younger people. She says, don't be hoodwinked by a gentle touch. Don't, don't let the woman make a fool of you. Now, I'm not calling out sisters. You know, everybody use whatever they use to get whatever they intend to get. But, you know, men have some games that they run too. But, 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 the, but the point that she was trying to make is you need to think the situation through. Check the motive. You know, sometimes folk can do good things for you, but the motive is all wrong. It's a setup for something that they intend to cash in on later. Jesus says that I am the good shepherd. He says that my sheep know my name. He compares it, our relationship to him, with the relationship that he has with the father. He's saying him and the father know each other. And Jesus is saying that if you are among my flock, then you ought to know my name. And when you hear my voice, y'all say, I know that's the Lord. Now I'm going to tell you, you can know that in your head and it not register in your heart if you let the cares of the world begin to weight you down. See, because when life gets tough sometimes, we can even begin to question whether or not the Lord cares about our situation. Oh, Lord, do you care? 
Lord, if you love me, why am I having so much trouble? Did not the disciples do the same thing on the boat? They said, oh, Lord, do you care if we, don't you care if we perish? Well, how in the world are you going to drown on a boat and Jesus is in the boat unless Jesus drowned with you and he's asleep? This text reminds us that Jesus is in the boat with us. And if Jesus is in the boat with us, the boat may rock, the waves may blow, water may splash up on you, but stay with him, you'll get to the other side. He says, I'm the good shepherd. If I ask you right now to write down three things that you would consider critical for the abundant life, what would your list look like? Some folk would start out with money. Oh, if I had all the money I want, I, that'd be first on my list. I know that's a start towards abundant life. Oh, some would say if I didn't have to work no more, that would be the abundant life. If I could live wherever I wanted to live in whatever house I wanted to live in, that would be the abundant life. But is that really all there is to an abundant life? I oftentimes wonder about that because in about four months, it's going to be a brand new year. People will make all kinds of resolutions. Most of the time when you look at people's resolution, it doesn't have anything to do with spiritual growth and development. You know, I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to lose the same 40 pounds that I said I was going to lose last year. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to take better care of myself. I'm going to start going to the doctor. But rather do people say I'm going to be more grateful in the coming year. I'm going to show more compassion towards others in the coming year. I'm going to be more faithful in service in local ministry in the coming year. I'm going to make some changes in the way I spend my time in the coming year. You see, so oftentimes the changes that we want to see in our lives is too often is all about us. But in order to fully live the abundant life, we have to be concerned about the lives of others. And that's what Jesus is pointing out in this text. You know why God is such a joy for God? Because he's always concerned about others. But he's not just concerned about human beings. God is concerned about all of creation. And we know that what we have experienced still lately in the world has seemed like creation has lost its mind. California is getting ready to experience a hurricane has not been one on, in California in the last 160 years. You see Hawaii, much of it being reduced to ash. 106 degrees yesterday. We haven't been on 100 degrees now in quite some time. It seems if creation has lost his mind. Maybe creation is saying we're going to start acting like human beings. Human beings have lost their mind while we join them. <laughs> the type of things that human beings have been doing lately simply will blow your mind. People doing all type of diabolical things and you ask them why and they don't even know. You ever ask your kid when they were small, they say, why did you do that? I don't know. But Jesus is saying that there's a better way to live our lives than that. We can live an abundant life, a life full with joy and contentment. I'm going to tell you, one of the most difficult things in life is to control your appetite. Not what you put in your mouth, but what you seek as you go try to collect things. You know, the collection of things will never make us happy. I don't care how beautiful it is. I don't care how it shines. I don't care how much it costs. It will only satisfy us for a short period of time. Some of you, the last time you bought your car, you promised yourself, I'm going to never eat in my car. Some of you smokers promise yourself that you are going to never smoke in your new car. Now when you get ready to clean your car out, you can get four orders of french fries and two hamburgers and a Big Mac. <laughs> yes. Why is this that so? Because after we make two car payments and wash it four times, it's just a vehicle. And see, this collection of things will not satisfy you and I. It must be something greater than that. 
The most important things that we possess in this life is our relationship with other people. Don't you know if you haven't found anybody who loves you unconditionally and who you love unconditionally, you are suffering from a joy deficit? I'm not talking about the folk you married. I'm talking about just good, healthy relationships. Friends who have been your friends for 50 years. Friends who will stand by you through thick and thin. Even when we have done something crazy and bizarre, responsible for our own trouble, after we finish crying in our coffee while we talk to them, they look at us in the eyes and they say, Fred, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. Yes. Finding people who love you and who care about you. And on days when you are crying and your heart is broken and grief is consuming you, when they don't know what to say, they pull up a chair beside you and hold your hand and cry with you. Does anybody love you enough to sit down and cry with you? I'm telling you something. Uh, crying, when you cry with others who love you, it doesn't... The pain is not quite as sharp. Yes, when somebody will cry with you, when somebody will tell you, say that, uh, we're going to make it. And they won't tell you, say, if you need anything, call me. They'll show up with something. You say, oh, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to do that. And they said, I had to. You are my friend. I'm talking about when somebody loves you. When they say that your, your friendship with them has come through the, the narrow gate. You know, you can know a whole lot of people, but you don't have no lot of friends. If you've got at least two friends in this world, you are wealthy. Beyond measure. It's easy to grow a crowd. All you got to do is get some brisket, some potato salad some peach cobbler made by somebody who knew what they were doing. I'm not talking about when the crust is all gummy and sticky. I'm not talking about that one. <laughs> I'm talking about <laughs> when you bite into the cobbler, the crust has a crunch to it. You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the one that when you finish eating, you say, if there's any left, I'll take a bowl to go, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make more some cobbler right now, in fact. But you see, it's these rich relationships that are in our lives that refreshes our souls like nothing else can. Have you ever been to a class reunion and somebody showed up at the reunion who you were used to be really, really tight with? And you all sit down and get to talking about days gone by and the joy that floods your soul. And you have the opportunity to get reconnected with them. And the, the restoration of the friendship. You make a commitment that I'm going to carry this one all the way to the end. I'm not going to get disconnected from them anymore. had the pledge and opportunity at the end of June to go back to a school reunion. And every time I show up for those reunions, it make me feel like sending a letter back to Houston saying, Houston, you got a problem. I won't be back. <laughs> but every time we gather in that little out-of-the-way place where can't nobody find but the son and the mailman, Every time we gather in that place and as we break bread together and as we listen to music and party a little bit, when it's time to go after those three days, Miss Jan, you be asking, where did the time go? Where did the time go? When you can gather in one place and everybody in the room with you, you have known even before you started first grade. That's one of the blessings of small towns. See, your best bud in the city of Houston, you may never even meet their parents, maybe once or twice, maybe at the graduation or on prom night. But you go back to these out-of-the-way places. 
And you say, wow, this is the abundant life. To have someone who I have known and who have cared about me for so long. Jesus wants us to get to know him in a very, very personal way. Not just as individuals, but collectively as a faith community. Do you realize what happens when God moves among God's people? Don't you know that as awesome as God is, he works better with groups than he do with individuals? Yes, he does. Don't look at me like that. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to. Don't you know that when you're by yourself or there's only one or two of you, you can grow weary after a while? You can get tired. Oh, but when you're part of a community, that everybody don't get tired at one time. And when you get tired, you got somebody to encourage you. Uh, when you get tired, somebody say, well, just take a break and rest a while. We, we got this until you refresh your soul. I looked at those children this morning, made me want to weep. You know why? Because I said, God is raising up a new generation. And this is your responsibility and my responsibility that we make this be a sweet journey for them. That we pay attention to them. That we invest in their lives. That we tell them that they are important. That occasionally when they are discouraged or in trouble, we don't want to talk about them and talk about their parents. We want to encourage them. Every time a child is baptized, one of the things we say is, is that we promise to do what? Pray for them, encourage them, model what it means to be a disciple in their presence, to nurture them in the faith. Those are not just words to be spoken from a liturgy. That's a commitment we make unto them in the presence of the Most High God. And we will have to give account for our failure if we do not honor that commitment. I'm one of those children that we saw singing today, 10, 15, 20 years from now. How many among us, after we have stepped into eternity, and someone may ask them a question, who influenced your faith? Who made an impact? Who encouraged you along the way? Will you be one of their youth workers? Will you be a Sunday school teacher? Will you be one who worked in the music ministry? Will anybody call your name and say you made an impact in their lives? I don't know about you, but as sure as we are born, we ought to impact at least one person's life in a positive way. And it should have such an impact that years after we are gone, they are still speaking about what happened as a result of meeting you. I'm going to let you go home in a moment. At least you'll be trying to slip out of a gate. I was driving down Interstate 70 a couple years ago between St. Louis and Kansas City, and my telephone rings. And the voice on the other end says, hey, guy, how you doing? This is Gregory Howard from Belzona. I saw Greg. I recognize your voice. He said, how have you been? I said, I'm doing great. He said, where are you? I said, I'm out here on the interstate between St. Louis and Kansas City. He said, I heard that you're in ministry full time. I said, yes, Greg, for quite some time. He said, I just recently retired. I said, Greg, I don't know when I might retire. And then he brought something back to my memory. He said, do you remember when we were at Hill Chapel Missionary Baptist Church on Gooden Lake Road? I said, who could ever forget it? He said, you remember the way my dad every second Sunday would have you and I to read scripture? One month, we'll read the Old Testament, and the 
The next month we'll read the New Testament and he will make us come into the deacon's office on Sunday morning and tell us, you boys have better not embarrass me. I said it got to the point before he could say it, we would say, Mr. Howard, these boys better not embarrass you. He said, I've been active in the church all of my life, he said. He said, I wonder is this a result of what my father deposited in me? He said, I wonder is there's a connection between what my dad had you to do every second Sunday and your call to ministry. I said, Greg, I never thought about it that way. I said, but it gave us the confidence to stand up in front of people without losing our minds. And you see, what you do today may seem small, but to do in the life of a child or a youth, but let me tell you, it will play major dividends down the road. That that young person may be somewhere giving a speech one day and they will share with their audience about that teacher who made a difference, that Sunday school person who made a difference, that custodian who made a difference, the plumber down the street who made the difference. See, we don't know when what we're doing may make a difference. That scripture that says that he who has begun a good work in us will bring it to completion. Yes, but see, the Lord uses other people to help do the work for him. See, the Lord won't show up here for rehearsal with the children. He dispatched his disciples instead. Yes. When people are struggling and need a little encouragement or they need a little food or whatever the need may be, he dispatches you and I as his agents. You see, he won't show up to do it for himself. Whatever needs to be accomplished in the earth, the Lord never shows up to do it by himself. He'll say, hey, brother, hey, sister, come go with me. I got something I need you to do for me. And he'll stand back and he'll supervise the work, Miss Jefferson. But see, he's calling on you and I to participate. You see, because to be a disciple means we must imitate him. How's your imitation working out? Have you ever been confused with the Lord? Have you ever had such an experience with a person who blessed you in such a way or you witnessed them bless somebody else and you said, today I saw the face of God? When we fully submit our lives to the Lord, when we allow him to do with us whatsoever he chooses, you will be amazed at what you and I are capable of doing. He's an awesome God. He has a wild imagination. And I want to encourage you today to set your imagination free. Get off the beaten path and let your imagination go wild. Don't you know it takes a wild imagination to step into the darkness and declare, let there be light. And there was light. It take a wild imagination to create the heavens and the earth. That's a wild imagination. It takes a wild imagination uh, to make the mountains. And then after all of that, it takes a wild imagination that James Weldon Johnson would say to go sit down by the banks of the river and not just get to making human beings, but he said he sat down by the banks of the river and he thought, and he thought, and he thought, because we serve a thinking God. Don't you know that God is a great thinker, the greatest of all thinkers? He has a plan, and all of creation, he did everything else. He got, the, he got the water right, he got the air right, he got the vegetations in place, he made all the animals in order to sustain humanity. And after he got everything done, he said, now, let us make human beings in our own likeness. You see, just like God, you and I are called to have a plan. Not just for our individual lives. We are called to have a plan for our faith communities. So I want to encourage you today, after you come through the gate, where there's safety. There's not just safety there. There's provisions in the pastor. 
You see, there's no lack anywhere in the kingdom of God. He never runs out of anything. His supply chain is never interrupted. So when you and I declare, we would do it, but we don't have enough time. We would do it, but Lord, we don't have enough money. Lord, we would do it, but we don't have enough people. The Lord is saying, stop it. The earth is mine and everything that's in it. I have given you everything that you need to accomplish the work that I'm calling you to do. God would not ask us to do anything that he is not equipping us to do in our individual life nor our collective lives. Talking about imagination. Listen, as a young lady talked about graduating from Prairie View to start historical black colleges right out of slavery takes imagination. The nerve of a people who just dropped their cotton sack talking about we're going to start a university. That's imagination. The nerve of a people who's saying, I don't have no money, but I'm going to send them to school anyway. That's imagination. It takes imagination to declare that life has been hard for me, but I want life to be better for my children. I'm going to make it be so. It takes imagination. A people who are not a people, God declared to be a people and said, if they don't let you go, I'll come down and make them fight among themselves until they lose you. That takes imagination. We need to encourage our children to dream big because they have at their disposal the divine imagination of God. We are made in God's image and likeness. And the next time somebody tell me about what they can't do, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get in my car, Miss Penny, and drive in the opposite direction as fast as I can. I'm going to spend the rest of my lives running from folk who talking about what they cannot do and say, what was that last person? What did they go that said they were getting ready to do something? Point the direction. I'm going to find them. <laughs> we can live a good life, an abundant life, but only if we are connected to Christ. And I'm not talking about just being saved. See, you can just be saved and get someone to sit down and live the same kind of hell you've been living all the time. But you've got to be active in, actively engaged in the kingdom of God. Have you ever thought there was something that you couldn't do, but you discovered once you got started, everything seemed to fall in place? If you went on a vacation this summer, raise your hand. If you went anywhere on vacation, raise your hand. All right, for those that I know went on vacation who didn't raise their hand, we'll cancel your vacation next year. <laughs> Some of you went on vacation and you had told yourself, I can't afford to go on vacation. I can't afford the airline ticket. I can't afford to rent a car. I can't afford <laughs> no spending change for entertainment. I think I just keep myself at home. Then you made a mistake. You sit down and you start thinking about it. You pull it up on your phone, either your laptop, and say, well, let's see how much the rooms are in Philadelphia. You say, oh, I may be able to pull that off. Let's see what the, the cost of the rental car is going to be. Say, what if I start saving now towards the vacation? And before you know it, you've been on vacation back home again. Why? Because you dare to imagine. You dare to investigate. You dare to count the costs. So the next time you say what you can't do, explore the possibilities and see what will happen. There's somebody who came to church this morning. When you woke up, you didn't feel like coming. Your body may have been hurting, but said, I'm going to get up and get me a cup of coffee then I'm going to see how I feel. I'm going to get in the shower. When I get out the shower, I'm going to see how I feel. I'm, I'm going to get dressed, and I'm going to see how I feel. And the next thing you knew, you was parking your car on the lot. Because when you do something, 
things begin to fall in place. When you, when you don't do anything, nothing falls in place. There's some folk who stayed at home today from churches all over this country, and they said, wow, if I'd have went to church, we'd have been out now. I should have went. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son to be sitting in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, reflecting on the fact that humanity is in trouble, to sit there and say, tell the Father, I'm going into the earth. I'm going to take on human form. I'm going to be born of a virgin Mary in Bethlehem. I'm going to end up on a cross at Calvary. Then on the third day, I'm going to get about the grave with all power in my hand. That takes a whole lot of imagination. But is anything too hard for God? I invite you to stand. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world just might be saved. If you're here today, and if you've never accepted the saving grace of God, today is your day. Everything that needs to be done for your salvation and my salvation has already been done. It is finished. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to go and fast for 40 days. This gift is completely free. No deposit necessary. If you're here today and you're saying to yourself, I don't want to get in front of all these folk, then see me immediately following the benediction. Amen? Hallelujah. You may be seated. As we prepare to receive God's tithes and God's offering on today, if you look on the back of your worship guide, you will see all the ways in which you can give electronically. There's also information that will be on the, church family. On the screen the in front of you on how to give Greetings electronically. Church Amen. Do you love the Lord? Hallelujah. Would your loved ones describe you so if you don't have patient, your, you don't have to worry about having your checkbook with you. Do you, have a you don't have to worry about having any cash on you. And for those who made uh, financial commitments at the beginning of the year, I want to encourage you to honor your commitment. Amen. Give back unto the Lord that which is right. And I want to continuously encourage those who are currently not tithers, start someplace. Start at 1%, 2%. And then as your financial strength improves, then improve your generosity. Amen. But I would rather take something into the presence of the Lord than to take nothing into the presence of the Lord, amen? For every good and perfect gift that ever comes our way is a direct result of the extravagant generosity of God. God has been good to you. God has been good to me, amen? And we want to be a people who seek to bless the kingdom of God and show some gratitude. So if you are in no position to tie it at this point, just make a commitment, one or two percent. Then maybe next year you can go to three and keep at it. Hallelujah. One quick announcement. 
So now, Ms. Thompson indicated uh, that there are some uh, books for elementary kids and school uh, and middle uh, school kids, and some of them are in Spanish. She indicated this is an excellent time to learn a, a second language. If I was starting out and I would have a kid now in school, I would certainly make sure that I learned to speak a second language. Sometimes it make a major difference in what you get compensated with at work. Amen. <laughs> so, hallelujah. We're going to ask at this time if acolytes will come. And for those of you who are writing checks, as you exit the sanctuary this morning, there will be individuals at the rear of the church who you can drop your financial gifts into the offering basket as you leave. For others, again, take advantage of electronic giving. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, thank all our guests for being with us today. Uh, we have an open door policy. The door is always open for you. Amen. I look forward to seeing you again. Hallelujah. I want to invite you to stand as we prepare for the benediction. In your own private devotion time, I want to encourage you to continue to be in prayer for the people of Hawaii. Amen. And pray for those who are in places like Houston who live in homes that have no air conditioning. Check in on them, will you? Seniors that you know. Encourage them to go to the library and the cooling centers so that they don't die from heat exhaustion in their homes. Amen? Hallelujah. Receive this blessing. Now, gracious God, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this marvelous gift of salvation. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you came into the earth that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, give us wisdom to recognize the thief, the devil, when he shows up. And Lord, you tell us in your word, Lord, if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Oh, Lord, give us a mind when the devil shows up that, that we don't embrace the devil, that we rebuke him in Jesus' name, for he can't stand the sound of your name. And now unto the one who is well able to give us the abundant life, now unto the one who stands at the gate to welcome us, now unto the one that will leave the gate to go look for the sheep that are lost, because it is not his desire that any should perish. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. And Lord, as we depart from this place, Lord, we will never forget, Lord, that our faith is portable. It's not stuck in Sunday, Lord. So may we take you with us throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people say it together, amen and amen.